This is a uh, this basically is going to be a talk uh, where we share some of the secrets of venture and angel investing with you. Uh, so I'm Kamal Hassan. I'm one of the founding partners of Loyal VC. Um, as mentioned, my colleague uh, Niti Vermani, uh, who's one of our venture partners, is on the call. Um, uh, we'll go sort of run through the talk, be about 25, 30 minutes long, and then we'll turn it over to you for Q&A. If you have any questions which come to mind as uh, the talk is going on, then please feel free to put them into the chat and we'll address them at the end. Um, uh, or you can just sort of save your questions from the end and uh, we'll jump in and take them then. Uh, so yeah, just as background, by the way, I've been an angel investor for about 20 years so far and uh, five years of venture investing. So this is uh, sharing a little bit of my experience from 25 years of in the industry, but it's also not just my experience. A lot of what we do is really try to be data-driven. So we spend a lot of time trying to find the different studies, facts, uh, things which are out there about this business to help you get a very data-driven, informed view of how venture and uh, of sort of the, some of the things behind venture and angel investing, because it is very much seen as something people learn by experience. And there's a lot of good data out there, which I think should really make a difference in how you think about this industry. So first question many people have if they're new to the space is why should they even think about investing in angel and VC? And the first simple answer is to match the economy. Uh, it's probably no surprise to people if you look at this uh, left-hand chart that 99, over 99% 99 of the companies in the world are private companies. Public companies are very rare, um, but public companies, of course, are big. What's maybe a surprise to many people is the graph on the right-hand side, which is those massive public companies we all know about, the Amazons of this world, are actually only responsible for 43% of the total sales in the economy, and 57% come from private companies. So whenever you see a newspaper article which says the engine of growth in the American economy is small business, well, of course it is. That's where 57% of the revenues come in. Uh, so if you want to match the economy, and if you're thinking about generally investing across the economy to try to match things, if you're doing only public companies, you've only got half the economy. Uh, so you want to think about privates as another alternative. Um, and if you look at technology specifically, in the good old days, in the 1980s, 1990s, you could invest in a, a company like Microsoft or Amazon when it listed in the public markets, and you could make thousands, uh, like two, 2,000 times your money back on that initial investment by getting it when it first listed. Unfortunately, behaviors have changed in the past couple of decades, and you can see if you invested in Google when it first listed in 2004, you get a 40x return to today. Facebook, more like a 7x return, and Uber, you wouldn't have made any money at all. And the reason why is there's this growth of mega VC and private equity funds who really uh, help tech companies stay private longer. And the result is, as a retail investor, you don't have much chance to get the growth in, um, you don't have much chance to access the growth in private tech, uh, in early stage private tech, unless you invest either as an angel in VC funds and PE funds. There was a brief blip where you could publicly invest in SPACs. By the way, I think we've seen over the past uh, few months that SPACs have really collapsed again, and it really is angel VCP is how to access these private tech returns. Now, 2022 was a very bad year for tech. I've only got data for the first few months of the year, but the, the trend has continued. Public software valuations are down 50%. Um, yes, that is absolutely true. It's actually in some ways a good thing um, because in venture, in angel investing, it's a very simple business. You buy low, you sell high. Back in 2021, when you were buying, many of the deals in the Silicon Valley, et cetera, were very highly priced, which means you would need to exit in five and seven years at a much higher return to be able to make money. And nowadays, when you're investing your money, you're sort of, uh, you're buying at half the price. So you're pretty well uh, doubling the returns you can expect on the successful companies when you sell them. So it's actually a really good thing that valuations are down. It was overheated. We were finding it hard to find good investments in the key hot markets last year. We did a lot of 
investing in uh, developing markets, et cetera, because the valuations are much more reasonable there. But now we're finding worldwide the valuations have improved, and it's a really good thing. And just remember, when you're investing, uh, venture capital is really about the home runs. Companies who will give you 10 times your money back or more, they're going to take five to seven years or longer to do that. So that's totally fine. Um, that valuations are down now because you're not going to sell until much later. Um, look, people worry a lot about, oh my goodness, the sky is falling, et cetera, right now in the economy. Just remember, the economic cycle, cycle is a normal thing. We've been here before. Um, you can see whether it's the um, your returns, your fundraising index, valuation index, these things move up and down. I've only gone into 2021 here, but I just wanted to show you we've had crashes and things moving up and down in the past. It's not a big deal. This happens. And uh, we're just in the midst of another one. And as, as mentioned, it's an interesting buying time if you're in, interested in this. So um, Loyal VC, the fund was founded by two people. And it's my, myself, uh, with managing partners, my, my colleague, uh, Michael, and I want to talk a little bit about my experience as an angel investor because it really informs a lot of our thinking today. So I started off doing angel investing like everyone else does, thinking the same things everyone else does. I was really confident when I started off. I had my undergrad in engineering physics, so technology does not scare me at all. Um, I, I was top of my class in my NCAD MBA, went on to, to work at Bain & Company as a consultant, giving advice to top corporations on how to run their businesses. And I walked in being very confident about my ability to invest, not only because of that, because I was then an entrepreneur I joined a business, ran a business uh, where I managed to increase the valuation by 10 times during the period I ran it, increased the company's revenue five times. So I walked in there saying, look, I know how to do this business. I've been a sex successful entrepreneur, in NCAD MBA, Bain and Company consultant. I can analyze and pick deals better than, than the average person can. And yes, I know the statistics in venture capital are seven deals out of 10 fail and two or three sort of do okay. And maybe you have one success and that's where you make all your money. But that, I was just walked in really confidently. And I learned humility. If you look at my first 10 investments, they were exactly industry average. Seven failed, two gave me my money back and a little bit more, one investment gave me 30 times my money back, but it took 14 years to get there. So I have 4.6 times my money back overall. I look like a good investor. It seems pretty good, but I learned a lot of humility along the, the way because the companies I thought would succeed failed. And the company which did succeed in the end, I wasn't sure would be the best one in the portfolio at all. Now, I'm not the only person who's learned this humility. Um, other very smart VCs have come to the same conclusion. Uh, Bessemer Ventures, uh, perhaps the oldest VC in the US, um, have their anti-portfolio up on their website. And this li lists a selection of the companies they had a chance to invest in and turn down. So we have, they said no to Apple, Coinbase, Google, Tesla, Zoom. And I mean, they often have very good reasons. So for instance, they said no to Friendster. They said, so said no to Facebook. They said, hey, kid, have you never heard of Friendster? Move on. It's over. PayPal. They said, it's a rookie team, regulatory nightmare. Forget it. And these are really good reasons and really good analyses. Um, so you've got really smart people um, who are making decisions which aren't working out that well. And I guess if you look industry-wide, um, you can look at these stats, but they should be very humbling um, as well as informative. So industry-wide, and we have good stats for the VC industry itself, 65% of VC deals fail. Fail to give you your money back, 50% actually will give you zero back, another 15% will give you less than you invested. The next 31% of deals will help you cover your losses. And in fact, if you look at the exact math, 65%, a small fraction of those give you a little bit of money back. But if you look at these top 96% of investments, they will give you 
around 1x your money. They will give you your money back from 96% of your deals in aggregate. And the last 4% of the deals, the home runs where you get 10 times your money back or more is where you make all your profit. And you can expect on an average VC portfolio to double your money over an eight year period or so with, as mentioned, half of the returns from the 96, half of the half from the 4%. And really when you think about that, these are the sick, I mean, every VC when they invest is convinced that every check they write is going to be a home run. Because if they didn't think it was going to be a home run, they wouldn't write the check. So you're talking about someone who 100% of the time, they're sure it's going to be a home run, and 4% of the time, they're right. So if you look at this, you really need to start to ask yourself, what type of activity is angel and VC investing? And there's a lot of people out there who say, look, angel and VC investing is easy. There's a formula. You learn the formula. You follow it. It's just like cooking. Now, cooking is very predictable. If you have a recipe, you follow the recipe exactly, you should be able to get exactly the results you, you want. And one of the things that we look at and ask ourselves about is we say, what if venture and angel investing is not like cooking? What if it's more like poker, where you have unpredictable outcomes? And for those of you who play poker, and, and I know not all of you do, but if you flipped up these two hands, these sort of three hands as your first two cards that you'd look at, if you have the pair of aces, you'd feel really sure you'd winning. And if you had a seven, four off suit, you'd look at that and you'd go, hey, this is crazy. But the value of the initial starting hand only gets revealed over time. And sometimes that hand you thought was the best hand that looked the best is the one that ends up winning out. But sometimes it's this four, seven, where as things evolve over time, you get the three, four, five, six, seven, uh, which is a much better hand than two or even three aces. So this is really the thing about poker is that things are unpredictable, but over time they become revealed. So we just asked ourselves, maybe it's a, maybe it should be more like this sort of, uh, this sort of activity, more like a poker. Uh, should be more how you invest. And in fact, uh, if you go out there and you look at the data, now AngelList has been uh, gathering data from a lot of startups from a lot of years, and the head of data science at AngelList sit down and did a bunch of analysis. And they said, look, uh, investing in every credible deal is more profitable. You're trying, and they said, if you index fund everything, every credible deal, um, you'll be 90 to 95% of investors picking deals. And this is what they found at the seed stage. And this is a very different view, which is you put money into a whole bunch of investments to avoid passing on the Facebooks of this world. And it should perhaps be a minimized false negatives industry rather than the minimized false positive, which is how the industry runs today. The traditional VC view is you only pick one out of every 100 deals to avoid losing money. And you say no to the 99 losers to pick the one winner. Well, maybe we should be thinking about this differently. And if you're investing your own money, you want to put smaller amounts of money into more deals is the, the number one takeaway. If you're going to invest in angel funds, well, in fact, we have some good data on the numbers here. So first of all, this is the logical explanation for why it works. Funding everything credible reduces the times you miss out on these very rare mega winners. But if you look at this data here and you group it together into a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, we've got a model here that we've developed which very closely matter, matches venture returns. So this is also saying that on average, venture investors pretty well all have relatively equal skill. And a lot of the differentiation happens with just luck, could be a conclusion here. But we have a model here which works fairly well, which says with 10 VC deals, you have a distribution which looks sort of like the VC industry. And if you increase that to 150 investments, you get a very different return profile. So first of all, surprise, surprise, you diversify, you reduce risk, 
you reduce volatility. And you can see that as opposed to a standard VC investment where you may lose all your money in a fund or you might make up 40% a year, when you diversify, you're going to have a much tighter spread of somewhere between 8 to 18% a year returns, which look very good compared to public markets. The second thing to notice is that the median return here has increased dramatically from about 6% to about 12%. And the reason why is the more investments you make, the more, if you have only 10 investments and home runs only happen one in a hundred, you're not going to have, uh, sort of only happen four in a hundred, you're not going to have very many home runs. Whereas if you have 150 investments, you'll have six home runs and you have a much more predictable result. So that is, um, if you're investing in venture funds, make sure that the venture funds you're investing in or your portfolio as a whole has hundreds of underlying investments in it. Now, if you're going to be doing this, this type of investing, remember good investing rules. And good investing rules are, of course, you want to diversify across multiple factors. So don't just diversify by number of deals. You also want to diversify by geography. Um, that's something we do. You can see we've made, it's, it's actually now um, 280 investments in over 50 countries. And you should also diversify by sector. If you have one Z VC fund you've got in your portfolio, which does blockchain in uh, Silicon Valley, well, that's great. But you probably want to be exposed to agriculture in Africa as well if you were following good investing logic. So just Take the same investing logic you take to public companies and apply it to your private portfolio also. Another type of diversification to look at is to diversify by time. These are the median returns across venture funds which launched in different years. And you can see here that the returns, a big chunk of things, if you chose to invest in a fund launched in 2002 versus a fund launched in 2010, you saw very different returns just from the average fund. And this is an industry where returns have sometimes been great and sometimes been not so great. I would argue that the returns are probably going to fall for later vintage funds as the valuations were going up. And now that valuations are down, we should see venture fund uh, returns go up. But my job as an investor is to say, look, things vary over time also very dramatically in this industry, diversify over time make investments year in, year out, year by year, so that you aren't stuck with this economic cycle impact. And that is something we do as a fund, is we are an open-ended fund, which is continually investing new money every month, every month into the market, whether it's up or down. Another way to think about diversif diversification, um, in fact, I just want to state uh, flat out, uh, venture capital has a diversification problem in terms of who is funded. Um, and you can see right now that 3% of venture capital dollars go to companies with a woman CEO. In fact, I saw a stat which said out of Europe in the past year was 1% or something like that. It's just absolutely crazy small. So I think we can generally agree that women are underfunded um, within this relative to their, per, their, their representation of the population and even relative to a representation of uh, engineering grads or uh, high tech company starter, start, uh, starter uh, founders, you see numbers more like 25, 30% for the percentage of women, not 3%. Now, there's a couple of other interesting stats here. Um, one of the theories is, well, one of the stats also is that a BCG disc study, which said uh, that you make 2.5 uh, uh, times more dollars in sales per dollar of funding in a, uh, a female-led rather than a male-led company. You could argue that means women are better. I would argue it's just that women are underfunded. So, of course, the few who get funded are the, the cream of the crop, and they outperform because the cream of the crop always outperforms. Um, relative to good, but uh, sort of a mix of men, some of whom the cream of the crop and some of whom are good, but not the best. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the industry about solving this through having more diversity of who the VCs are and that more diverse VCs will hence invest in more diverse entrepreneurs. Um, the, the data doesn't bear that out. 
Um, according to Crunchbase, uh, there's now 16% of VC decision makers who are women, and that's growing uh, in the past decade. Yet the percentage of dollars that go to, to women-founded companies has stayed the same. So actually, and so the theory, will women fund women, hasn't been borne out. There is some science behind this, which I think it's good for all of us to be aware of. Um, because it leads to a, a pretty strong conclusion, which is the traditional way of funding via pitches should be left behind, that we should ditch the pitch. And the study was pretty simple. Study out of Harvard, they took a whole bunch of uh, people who were going to judge different pitches of companies for funding, men and women, and they took an identical script and they had it read to different groups of people by male actors or female actors with identical slides, identical script, identical pitch. And then they also showed photos of who the purported entrepreneur was to go along with this. And they found a very dramatic result, which is if you had a good looking man presenting the business, they had a much higher score than if it was a much less good looking man, which still in that case had higher scores than if it was a woman. So you can see here that there's a very strong variation for an identical pitch of a score as low as 4.14 to 5.21 on average, based solely on the photo you showed and the gender of the person who was voicing it. So the result is, and this, the investor gender, whether it's a man or woman, had no effect on the scores. So if you look at this, you should ask yourself and say, well, gosh, I know that if I'm using a pitch process, I am selecting by the gender and the looks of the presenter. Does that pick the best entrepreneur? Probably not. Hence, really question whether you should use a pitch process. And the, the question, of course, is if you don't use a pitch, what do you do? Well, it's very simple. Be data-driven. Judge entrepreneurs on what they do, on how they perform, not what they promise. And there have been a number of funds out there, including our own, um, but there's also uh, ClearCo, um, Social Capital, which have been funding entrepreneurs often blind based on their results, their data. And people who do that typically fund 30 to 40% women CEOs, pretty well matching the distribution of the entrepreneurs. So if you fund based on results and metrics, it dramatically reduces your gender bias. And what that does is it also improves your returns because you're investing in the best possible entrepreneurs, not the best of only half of the entrepreneurs out there. Now, if you look at Loyal VC and what we do, we've got a couple of principles that drive what we do. And yes, we are very big on diversification that protects your capital. It's a great thing to do in investing generally. And it shouldn't surprise anyone that diversification is a good thing to do. The other thing we do is we do staged investing. Um, and we really do this staged investing to drive returns. It's really talking about a poker investing strategy, which I will come to in a second. Um, we can do this, we can afford to do this staged investing because we're an open-ended fund, which is also great for investors because it's very flexible. And we also use the power of networks as well. So what's the secret behind staged investing? What's the process? Well, it's very simple. What we do is we start uh, every company off with a fixed investment amount of $10,000. And we move through fixed stages after that where every month we pick the top 2% of the companies at one stage in our portfolio to move on to the next stage. So it's a $10,000 stage, top 2% get 200,000. It takes about 10 months on average. The top 2% of those get a million dollars, again, after an average of about 10 months. And we just continually follow this process every month. Now, really what this is doing is just matching how poker players invest. Poker players will invest money initially based on those first two cards, but they will put most of their money uh, at work. And they often hear people talking about doubling down, putting down double, triple, five times the money on later bets when it's more clear what the quality of the hand is. As the quality of that hand is revealed over time, then all of a sudden you can see your odds improving, getting worse, changing, and you can invest with much more knowledge or you can, yeah, 
put the money down with much more knowledge. And we follow, the, uh, this is actually a very hard thing to do. Um, professional poker players are very aware of the cognitive biases they're dealing with and really try learning how to manage their emotions, their decision making. And we are very aware of it as well. And I think if you want to invest by the numbers, you have to be aware of biases. And sure, I've talked about biased outcomes in terms of gender, but there's a bunch of other biases to be aware of. So there's, for instance, a sunk cost bias where you look at how much money you've already put into investment to help you decide whether or not to put more in. This is a very expensive bias to have, and we compensate for that by having fixed upward amounts because you're never going to invest a million dollars to save a $200,000 investment. We also have an endowment effect where you fall in love with specific deals, specific types of hands, et cetera. And we compensate for that by only funding top 2% of our portfolio every month. So it really forces you to pick only the best and you may want to fund other companies, but when you can only fund one in 50 companies every month, that really stops you playing favorites. There's also overconfidence where people fall in love with a the deal, they're sure it's going to succeed. So therefore we, do, we overcome this by having fixed investment size, uh, sizes. And there's a number of other biases to be aware of which we compensate for and how we invest. And if you're investing as an angel, you should look at closely. Now, these things sound great in theory. What is the results? Well, I'll just show you here a little bit of our own results. And I, I showed a little warning at the top about how this is not supposed to be for investing, et cetera. This is really for education. But just so you can see for your own education, um, you can see that our returns from these initial pilot investments, which sort of match the market, have been about 10%, which is a pretty uh, expected average venture capital fund return. And you can see how these returns here have sort of shadowed the market. The market is down uh, sort of 10, uh, the market is off 10-ish or so percent in the past year. And guess what? We're off uh, our, the average pilot investment, the small $10,000 checks are off about 8-ish uh, or so percent. But what's really interesting is if you look at those follow-on investments, and I should just emphasize here, if you look at how much money is uh, deployed, we put 3% of the money into these first checks and 97% of the money into these follow-on checks. And if you look at the follow-on checks, we've had returns of sort of in excess of 25% annually and have managed to hold or slightly increase in value in those investments at a time when the market as a whole has been going down. Um, so yeah, we've done a pretty good job here of um, well, this theory of small amounts and invest more when you see the results seems to be bearing out in practice. Now, one of the things when you're an experienced VC, uh, experienced VCs often say, look, it can be very easy to figure out if a company is doing well. You just look at the data and when you see the data performing well, you can see companies taking off. And the more you look at this, the more you start to focus on data, the more you say, hey, <laughs> I can see this company is doing really well. The challenge then becomes not figuring out which startup to back, but whether or not the startup lets you invest. And there's a lot of confusion in the industry about this right now. So there was a survey out there by Kaufman Foundation. And what the industry will tell you is, the best, the best VCs go to the best funds. That's the big brands. That's the Sequoia, et cetera. And when, uh, when a Kaufman Foundation surveyed VCs on what matters in an investment, that illusion is that exactly what came out. They asked the VC and the VC said, what matters is relationship, number one, the brand of the VC, the number two, and the deal terms were the number three factor. They then asked entrepreneurs what they looked at. And entrepreneurs said, we don't care about the brand of the VC. That's factor number eight. Uh, 
what uh, we don't care about the investors experience even so much in this industry. We couldn't care at all about the sector focus. We care about three things. We care about relationship. Yes, number one. And deal terms are actually more important than you think. That's number two. But investor speed is the third most important thing. Now, this is uh, if you are, if you're an angel, learn from this to invest very quickly because that's what entrepreneurs value. And if you're part of an angel group, push your angel group to improve your cycle times, to improve your processes, because the best deals will get funded quickly and you want to be sure you get into them before they close. If you're investing in VCs, well, look, the myth out there is that hey, you invest in Sequoia because the best funds come to Sequoia. But actually, there are lots of good early stage funds, emerging managers who will be the best ones out there because they've got a process that can move very quickly and because they build up good relationships with entrepreneurs. And in fact, that's something we see in the industry every year. If you look at who the top 10 performing funds are every year in the industry, typically more than half of them are emerging managers who are on their first or second fund. Um, so that is sort of a behavior out there. And just be very aware that this is that brand does not matter in here to the entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs care a lot more about you giving them the money quickly on good terms. Now, the things I'm telling you here are not secrets in the industry. The industry has been starting to move this way people do understand the data. So you've got the 500 startups of the world who understand entirely the value of protecting your capital with broad diversification. And if you wanna protect capital, you have to diversify. This staged investing we're talking about, driving returns through much higher follow-on funding and very small first checks. Think of it as an ante to just get in there and see your cards. And then you do your real betting after your ante if you're using a poker example. There's been a number of people who've been doing this. Uh, Sequoia has been famous for years of having their scout funds where they get a bunch of scouts running around with small checks to give them inside access to the best deals for their follow-on funding. Uh, it's been relatively rare to combine the, for those two strategies, but Loyal is one of the funds who is doing that. And there are other funds starting to move into this space. Um, look, um, Sequoia are very smart people. We love them. Uh, they look at the data like we do. Um, they've got a couple of uh, our approaches that, that uh, our approaches that they follow with the global diversification. But one of the thing uh, and the stage investing. But one of the things they've also done is they have moved to an open-ended fund. And it makes a lot of sense to be an open-ended fund if you're going to do stage investing. If it takes a year to move from stage to state, from each stage to the next stage, you want to do that. And also Sequoia says you want to become a partner to your venture, to your entrepreneurs over time, not someone who's given them money right now, but is looking to jump on their back to have them sell out in five or six years. And that in fact is one of the things to be aware of if you are investing in this space. When you make an angel investment, you are locking your money away for a long time. Now, it, in, in theory, it's sort of people talk about seven to eight years, which is when about half of M&A should happen. I told you my own best performing investment that gave me 30 times my money back took me 14 years to exit. So you can end up waiting a very long time to get your money back as an angel, um, or you can give it to a VC fund and the VC fund will make you wait a very long time till you get your money back, though they will guarantee it back in 10 years. Um, it can also be a fairly long time to, to fail, but just be very aware. And there is, a, there is a problem in venture investing right now is because they have to close their fund at the end of 10 years, they are forced to sell their assets at a discount, typically a 20 to 30% discount. So you spend all this time building up returns over the years building up valuable assets, and then you're forced to sell them all and take a haircut at the end, driving down the returns, which doesn't make a lot of sense to us. That's why we've got an open-ended fund. We aren't the only ones who think this. We believe that this is the future of the industry, is to give, if you want to lock your money away for 10 years, you can be an angel. You can do it yourself. 
And what can a venture fund offer you that you can't get as an angel? A venture fund can offer you liquidity. They can offer you an open-ended fund with a price set every quarter that allows you to buy or sell the assets at that price. If you are going to be open-ended, you have to be very reactive on valuation. And remember, if you're investing in a venture fund, I mean, certainly in our venture fund, uh, we've got our own money in the fund. And if you, if you um, uh, inflate your price uh, or inflate the value of the company, you're going to be doing a, uh, you're going to be doing a disservice to your existing investors because smart people will just sort of sell out expenses, uh, sell things out. They'll they'll uh, basically you have to price accurately. The second you don't price accurately, you are going to have problems with people taking advantage of your mispricing. So you have to price like a trader. You have to price very mark to market very quickly as opposed to looking on this as administrative activity. Um, so just be totally honest. If you invest in a company three months ago and the valuation was $10 million and in the past month, the whole tech team has resigned and left the company, yeah, you might have a transaction which is three months ago at 10 million, but the company is not worth 10 million without its tech team and you should mark that investment down. And similarly, if you've got investment you made and the company has tripled their sales in three months, well, you probably weren't expecting the sales to triple in three months. And if you weren't, then they're outperforming and mark them up. So yeah, let me give you a full summary right now of what I've talked about. And these are some of the investing principles we use and some of the data behind them. So I talked about why you want to be an angel investor. It's because you want to match the market. Tech is private and it's half the economy, um, tech staying private. So you need to do that. Uh, we talked about angel and venture investing and whether this should be done, whether this is a recipe book or it's more like poker where the future is unknown, uncertain, and no crystal ball can predict what is coming. And I've certainly learned humility that myself as a number of other investors have to really push us more towards thinking about this as a poker activity rather than a recipe activity. Um, if you're going to do angel investing, it is crucial to diversify your portfolio, just like in any other investing activity. It's just the numbers are a little bit different. If you want to end up with 30 investments in your portfolio that succeed, then you need to do over 100 angel investments. If you want to end up with 10, with a sort of 10 or more uh, home runs, then you need to do 250 or more investments to have that many home runs in your portfolio. So you need to diversify, but also remember to diversify by geography, by sector, all the basic, th and across the economic cycle, all the basic things you should be doing anyway when you diversify. Um, I mentioned the problem of, of, of pitches, of pitches being biased. That's just the outcomes people have. So think about investing more on the data and less on pitch. And I talked about the importance of staged investing, that the staged investing is the big circuit we use, and you've seen our numbers, that we can improve the returns by over 10% per year by using a staged process of small amounts and funding the top few percent based on success rather than um, rather than just sort of doing a few big bets up front. Um, and I've also talked about biases and investing as an access game, being sure that you build up a good relationship, move quickly as an investor and offer good terms. It's not about your branding. Uh, sorry to disappoint the marketing people on the, on the call. It's really about the quality of what you offer to the entrepreneur. So yeah, and lastly, I just touched on open-ended funds, which I think are something which we should be offering to the industry as a whole. So let me stop there and throw it over to you for any questions you may have. I see there's a few questions have come in through the chat here. Um, uh, Zavina, you've got a question of the halo effect. I suppose the question is around the halo effect, um, uh, which uh, people get from brand name funds. Do you, do you want to say more about that question? Zavina? Okay, so I'm going to guess that that halo effect refers to the, hey, if you're with a big brand, it gives a halo to support you as an entrepreneur. Look, I'm sure it can have an effect. 
that's what people say it should do. Um, I have been very, um, I have been very shocked with my conversations with Silicon Valley insiders is uh, when you're an outside, hey, I can make money through investing with, can make money through investing with these big brand name funds. Um, one of the things you see which happens with these big brand name funds is they become oversubscribed in the core fund very quickly. And then they will set up a whole series of add-on funds and I remember a conversation I had with one very experienced Silicon Valley insider who I was presenting loyal to him. And I said, would you like to invest in loyal? And he said, um, look, I have invested with big brand name fund. I, I, I will save them the embarrassment of being listed, but it's one of the top five brands. Um, I've invested in this fund and I lost money. They had a special founders fund for, for, for Silicon Valley founders to invest with them. And I invested in their deal and I lost money. And if I lost money, even with this big brand name fund, well, then the whole asset class makes no sense. And I would argue, no, it's not the asset class, which doesn't make sense. You probably didn't diversify enough. So diversify enough when you do it. That's one of the secrets to look at. And, um, and, and, and yeah, it's not about that brand. The brand may have some effect for some companies. I'm sure they use it. Um, the, ah, okay, Savina. Uh, so, uh, so, but it isn't really there. Savina, I understand. You're talking about the halo effect uh, in terms of being biased about founders. Yeah, I mean, look, there's all sorts of biases jump in. And it really is, you make money by investing in people who perform uh, as shown by what they do, not in people you think will perform. Uh, there's a small enough group here that someone has a question, you can probably unmute and just state the question. Uh, so please uh, feel free to do that if you have a question. Yeah, well, I, I have a question, uh, Kamal. Please. Uh, so so you, you've, you've said how important it is to diversify, uh, both geographically and also by sector. But how can you be sure that you've actually got like a good sample? How do you, how do you know that you've you know, are able to understand what all the different opportunities are, there are that you've been able to access those opportunities. Uh, well, yeah, and, and this is one of the, the, the sort of the dominant conversation in venture is about being sure you've been able to access all the best opportunities, which really comes down to can you predict who's going to win? And then we come back to the Bessemer Ventures who they had all the access they needed to get Apple, Google, Facebook, FedEx coming in the door to them, and yet they turned them down. And I would argue it's not a business about knowing you've accessed all the best opportunities um, because you can't know what the future is. It should be a business about getting a large number of credible opportunities out there. And that's what will protect your capital. And then I'm arguing for, you don't know ahead of time who's good till you're in them. But once you're in them, you start to know who's really good. And that's where you focus your funds. But it is saying you fund a diverse subset, not knowing which of those subset will succeed, but making sure you're running a process that that subset is a good distributed group. Right. So, so you don't have to know about every opportunity. You just have to have a good set of opportunities yes. that falls through the protocol that you've defined. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's really about how do you get venture capital average quality companies? If you can get venture capital average quality companies, then you should do well as a fund if you follow the preferential investing. But if you have, and, and one of the things we do, we as a fund, we source um, from we source entrepreneurs from only two sources. Uh, one is the Founder Institute Accelerator, and we've got, as I see, one or two people on here from the Founder Institute, but we source only Founder Institute Accelerator companies and alumni of INSEAD Business School. And we're not saying that INSEAD and Founder Institute are any better or worse than Harvard and Y Combinator. What we are saying is we're trying to avoid negative selection bias. And we have pretty good access in both of those groups that everyone from the people who run the businesses on down to the local level people in the different countries 
know who we are, so we are likely to see all companies, including the best. Whereas if I were to source companies from Harvard or MIT, the first thing I'm likely to run into is negative selection bias, which is the best Harvard and MIT companies have been funded by people who are at the heart of those networks. And I'm only going to see the ones that aren't funded. Uh, which is the ones that have been pre-selected out by other people. Now, there still may be the Facebooks and the Googles of this world in there, but I've got negative selection bias. I'll get worse returns on the whole in my portfolio. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Ina, got a question here. Uh, question how to uh, balance diversification versus ability to add value to a startup, which you can do more if you have strong knowledge of a sector. Look, that's a really good question, Hina. Um, the way we handle that in our business model is we split apart the uh, investing activity and the value adding activity. So I have a network of hundreds of people, as I'm sure people on this call all do. And when someone comes to me and says, can you help me with my marketing strategy? I'll say, yeah, I know a little bit about marketing, but guess what? I know out of my network of hundreds of people, there are five people I can name who are far smarter on marketing strategy than I am. So I will send you to them. Or if you want someone to talk to about selling to big banks, I can find you five people in my network who are better at selling it to big banks. So what we do is we say our job is, is adding value is really important as a VC, but you should add value through mobilizing the right people from your network to add that value. And if you think you are the best person to help a company more than one or two percent of the time, uh, you've got a horribly inflated view of your self-worth because <laughs> you don't recognize the value of the people around you. Um, so that's really what we do is we say adding value, yes, is important, but you add value by getting them the right people at the right time to help them. And the right person, if you're being humble about this, should rarely be you and should almost always be someone else you know who is smarter about that specific subject or industry than you are. Um, you're also talking about the ability to price appropriately and have speed. Look, when it comes to pricing appropriately, you're absolutely right that the more deals you see, the easier it is to price. There are general rules of thumb you can use. I'm a big fan of looking at um, when a company ha has predictable revenues, you start looking at revenue multiples and price to earnings ratios and cost to acquire a customer versus long-term value. It's all pretty basic stuff, which anyone who looks at this will know. Um, at the early stages, you have no idea what's going on with the company when I mean, you're funding based on a dream. Well, if you're funding based on a dream, there, there is no formula and you just have to decide which dreams you buy into. Our view is we don't invest very much money based on a dream. We'll invest $10,000 based on a dream and then we'll invest the rest based on results. Um, but yeah, you can, that, that I think also is a difficulty. In fact, we tell our entrepreneurs this. An entrepreneur will come to us and they'll say, I want to work, we say, we want to work with you. And they say, okay, great. Uh, and we'll say, let's figure out your valuation. They say, we want to value the company at $7 million. And my answer always is, which we'll say, okay, great. We'll fund it at $7 million because I don't know how much your company should be worth. But I will know in five months how much I should have paid for the company. And if I find out I should have paid $3 million and I paid $7 million, you're going to have a, a, a slightly upset investor who won't want to put more money into you just because they're a little bit pissed off at you. I mean, we'll still put more money in if we think it's good. And if I got a great deal, I'll feel really good about you. Um, but that is uh, pricing is, is, is something which you cannot know when you first look at a deal and you only know, know afterwards. And, you know, honestly, there's a lot of people who price relative to an industry. I've seen that. I mean, I've seen our entrepreneurs try to pull that all the time. And they go, well, such and such a competitor was, was, uh, is a valued at $50 million last month in their raise. Therefore, we should be valued at $20 million. <laughs> It's just like, no, because those are different businesses. Industry is not really a good indicator at the micro level when you're at the startup level. What really matters is how a company is performing 
on its individual micro level. It's not about what the industry is doing. I mean, you can be investing in, the comp in, a, in an industry which is dropping 10% a year, but when you're looking at a startup which should be growing by 40 or 50% a month, well, if you're growing by 40 or 50% a month, you don't care if your market's down by 10% a year because you're just at 0.001% of the market and you're growing, going to grow to 0.1% of the market. And all of a sudden you've grown your business by a hundred times. You've made a lot of money for your investors. Um, so yeah, I, I think sector matters a lot less. Um, and yeah, so that's the, and having speed, look, you, you have speed, but just by setting up a good process, you decide what process you're using for diligence, set up a good process and be responsive to entrepreneurs. Um, I often say uh, to our team that we're in the customer service business and the customers we're serving are the entrepreneurs. And when an entrepreneur applies to us, our goal is to get that process as quickly as we can and never in always in under a month and ideally in weeks because we have to serve them by being responsive. Kamal, there are two questions. Yes. Got. Uh, so the first one is that uh, given the fact that Sequoia has moved towards a open-ended fund, structuring all their funds into one single open-ended fund, and you know, with Loyal VC having already been there. So is, is there a trend towards a different structure expected in the industry? Where should we as an investor uh, put our funds in, you know, so so the comparison is coming between open-ended and the traditional VC structures here. Yeah. So and, look, as yeah, yeah as yes, an investor, sorry. it's really simple. Would you rather invest in a fund where your money is locked away for 10 years, where they have capital calls? So in year two and year three, you need to find more money to give them to protect your investment. Uh, and then you sit back and wait for the money to come back. Or would you rather invest in a fund where four years in you say, hey, I'm buying a cottage and I need to cash out some of my investments to buy the cottage and I'd like some of it to come from this fund? I, I, I think that's a pretty easy answer. Is this where the industry is going? Yes, I think it's where the industry is going, but it's going there over a very slow time frame. And the reason why is that the limited partners... Uh, the fundamental top end of this industry is the limited partners, the limited partners, traditionally pension plans, et cetera, very conservative people. Uh, innovation is not rewarded. People who are very much about protecting their reputation rather than people who are looking at, uh, honestly, they, they are more worried about protecting their job than they are making a bonus because they don't make a big bonus for good returns. They, they get fired if they do a bad job. So the result is, that the open-ended structure, uh, I, I've talked to a number of limited partners about this and I've said, hey, so I see Sequoia's doing this now, does that mean you're more interested in open-ended funds? And the answer I get back is, well, Sequoia can do it because they're Sequoia <laughs> and they're forcing us to take uh, to, to accept those terms, but it's not something we're driving. And I think it's going to take another two, three, four more years before the wisdom of it starts to be seen by the, the large entities and as, as a VC, most VCs are driven by keeping the large limited partners happy, not by keeping the average investor happy. Uh, I just typed the second question, but I'll speak it out. Uh, the question is that Loyal VC being a global fund, uh, how is the due diligence carried out uh, you know, across so many countries, like 50 yes. plus countries? So, so we can answer that three ways. Um, the first way is, thank goodness for technology and Zoom, because we can have monthly meetings with a company anywhere in the world. And a lot emerges when you have monthly meetings month after month after month. And when you're on the call, you say, oh, great, wonderful. You just signed this client. Could you pull up and just screen share the contract right there for me? Um, so it's very easy to do that sort of diligence. Um, the second thing, of course, is we have this network of a thousand people who support our portfolio companies and they are spread around the world. So I don't care where it is. We'll have someone on the ground as needed. Um, but the third element, which is a key part of our model, is that we invest through networks. So we only invest in people through the Founder Institute or the or the INSEAD network. And when someone shares a network with you, they are much less likely to cheat you because if they try to cheat you, um, if they try to lie to you, um, uh, sort of massage the truth, et cetera, 
they are potentially hurting their standing within a larger network. There's actually a fourth thing in there, which I didn't mention. One of the things we do is we do personality testing of entrepreneurs. It's a standard test developed by the Founder Institute. And one of the things that is checked for in that test is whether or not somebody, someone, for instance, has sociopathic tendencies. Because someone who's a sociopath is very charming, pitches very well, but can't build a team around them because nobody wants to work with them. So, um, so yeah, we use those four things, I guess, together. And two of those the personality testing and the uh, the the sort of the Zoom based diligence over many months anybody could do, and the other the local stuff we can do because of the networks we have locally and because of our own advisor network out there. Good. We have time for maybe one last question. Yes, if people are interested in investing and want to learn more, you need to be an accredited investor. But if so, you're welcome to come to loyal.vc slash ask us anything, and that will tell you more about the fund. But as mentioned, we can only offer to accredited investors. Um, good. Last chance. All right. It's a good time to wrap up. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Hope you've enjoyed this talk. Hope you've learned some things to help with your own investing, whether it's investing as an angel, investing in venture funds. And if you aren't doing it yet, I really hope that I've opened your mind to thinking about how to get private assets into your portfolio, because I generally a good thing to have. Thanks very much.